a lot of people don't understand why I keep on talking and harping on about COVID. Isn't it over? Hasn't the WHO declared the pandemic is past? Everybody is moving on. It's just a cold. Why in the world do I keep on talking about it? The reality is that I know some stuff that very few people know. In my journey of interviewing experts over the years, I talk to people before and after the interviews, and they say things off air that they would never say on air. And so I've always known that there's some pretty serious stuff that needs to be addressed. And as early as 2022, when this was not able to be said, I was writing about this question. Why are independent scientists ignoring the question of SARS-CoV-2? The article here on my substack is in the description if you want to go back to what I was thinking. And I thought that it was important at this time, as we go into the transition of the winter, why I am concerned. Because I think we keep on underestimating this beast. And it's largely because people keep on thinking it's just another virus. The question is, suppose it is not. And that's the bit that, from a clinical point of view, forget the politics, we need to keep our minds open. Because if it isn't, it's not going to behave like a normal virus. If you don't know this, the original SARS-CoV disappeared completely within two years because it ran out of ways to mutate and it just stopped. This is not the case here. And we are not seeing the end of these variants anytime soon. The question we have to ask is where is this going to end? So as part of the history, because you may not be aware of some of this history, I'm going to remind you of a very important news article. Because for those people who don't remember, there was this question of a lab leak in early 2020. And then there was a paper that was produced by a lot of experts saying that it was not. This was clearly from the wet market. There was no question about it. Anybody who asked anything different was spreading misinformation. Then what happened is that people do what people do. And I have observed quietly some of the strange patterns around, say, for instance, what happened with the shooting with Charlie Kirk and the fact that so many people are just getting out phone images and studying it. And I'm thinking to myself, if there is anything that is not right, they are going to find it because this is just what people do sometimes. And in this case, this is exactly what happened to that lab, lab leak idea. Literally, this guy, the Seeker 268, the world's foremost virus origins hunter. You have to look at the date of this. This is July. 11th, 2021. This was in the peak of the rollout of the vaccines and it got lost. It was published in the week in India. And this guy, known only by his Twitter handle, took a deep dive on the internet looking at evidence that reignited the debate on the origins of the COVID-19 virus. If this guy or his team, it's what they call the drastic, a group of internet sleuths who made the world relook at the lab leak theory. I've got to interview one of them, um, and I, I'd spoken to him previously, and I'd want to speak to him again. But in, in a sense, these guys just refuse to let it go. And what they did is that they found evidence that there was research on this virus prior to the outbreak. I mean, years before. There are some patterns. And say, for instance, people don't know about the furin cleavage site. This is a patented um, uh, thing that was added. Well, 
it could have occurred naturally this tiny little furin cleavage site that makes these viruses the spike protein more infective but in order for it to have occurred naturally it was like one in a trillion chance who would think one in a trillion chance that some virus in a bat cave would get a furin cleavage site when coincidentally it happens close to a viral a lab working on coronaviruses and the furin cleavage site is patented as i said I spoke with the researcher who found the blast sequence for the furin cleavage site. He sat on that information for almost eight months. He had no idea what to do with the fact that he found a fingerprint that indicated that this was very unlikely to be natural. He ended up doing a paper with a combination of researchers, for which I know some of them. And they essentially came to the conclusion that they were working on a virus. This is their thought. They were working on a virus, looking at the capability to infect cells for cancer therapy. This is what they thought. And so they put a furin cleavage site on it so that it would be more effective at infecting human cells. The problem is, what happens if this leaks. Now, there are two sides of the story, and this is why I'm highlighting this is so important. Because on one side, people say that it is a bioweapon. It's possible. On the other side, they may have been working on it for research purposes, and then somebody just messed up, and you end up with a leak. One of the things that this guy came up with, and he found from doing intensive research at the time, um, and this is him here, he was looking at, he had some particular details that they were trying to relocate the lab. So because they were relocating the lab, and so this is in Wuhan, so he was digging up the Wuhan CDC web pages and was making a thread about it. So they were thinking of relocating the lab and they were working on disposing of two tons of bio waste, okay? There was a December 4th notice in which they showed a heat map, which basically looked like a spread of disease across Wuhan. So it seems as though there was a contract out to remove bio waste. And this is part of the reason why in their mind, this was a lab leak rather than an intentional spread of the virus. And so this lab situation then ended up with a spread. However, he also noticed there was another strange thing that they did. They took out a tender in September for our PCR kits for testing viruses. Now, it was a long list of viruses, but it also included the coronaviruses. So, this could have been coincidental, but this part about disposing of bio waste really does suggest that this could have been how this virus came into being. Okay. And you have to remember if anyone tells you that this was natural origin, remind them that after five years of research, we haven't found an animal host, which was intermediary between the wild and humans. My simple question was, if it did originate in the wet market, the person who went and got whichever animal in the wild would have had to go to his home, package it up, transport it in, walk around, move around, and in all that time, if that person was infected, he would have spread it, and there should have been a trail of infection all the way to the wet market. We don't see that. So the important point is that we still don't know. But here is the point I am making. If, if, let's just say if for the time being, if this was done in a lab, why would you expect that it would follow the same patterns as a normal a virus that evolved in the wild, like the SARS-CoV? 
That's the question. So when people tell you that this is just a cold or no big deal, just remind them that we still don't know the origins and that we have never seen a coronavirus like this doing what it's doing. You have to remember, this beast can infect multiple cells. It uses, I think we had reached up to 29 different kinds of receptors to enter cells. It literally can infect almost anything. It infects the immune system. It infects the vascular system. It infects the respiratory system. It infects the gut. I mean, it in potentially interacts with bacteria. I mean, this, this is unprecedented. We have never seen anything like this. And so when I know this kind of stuff, and I see these kinds of questions, it makes me realize this is not going to be simple. And so all the hope that it just goes behind us and becomes endemic and it's no big deal, I would say I would love for that to happen, but I don't expect it. Because everything that I'm seeing indicates that this is not going away. The final thought that I'd like to give you from this, um, this, this, this article is something that I had said at the time in 2021 that I think I couldn't have said publicly. This is why I had to put it on Substack. And it was a very simple point. Whichever way we take it, even if people were messing around in a lab and this was an accidental lab leak, it still raises the question about the capability of this of this virus if the gain of function research is true because of the targeting in terms of older comorbidities you know it seemed as though some people were deemed expendable you have to remember certainly early in the pandemic children really weren't that affected and that's unusual for uh, a serious virus. Normally it will kill neonates and older people. It's not that little children didn't get unwell with it, but they didn't really die. Now, it's important to know that's different now. Children are now getting sick with Omicron. That's a whole different conversation. But at the time, it was, it was like a perfectly designed virus that targeted the people who had the most health-related issues. And when I looked at it from the perspective of ACE2 and serum ACE2, which is what I focused on in terms of autoimmunity, the people who have elevated serum ACE2 have the highest cardiometabolic risk. And this is something that will become a, a, an area of, of, of study and testing for the future and serum ACE2 seems to be very strongly correlated to the severity of disease. We have many more questions that need to be answered, but one thing is for certain, as we go into this winter and we go out again and into another winter and you find that there are more and more variants, please remember this had never started off as anything normal. I suspect it's not going to disappear quickly. Have a great evening. Uh -huh. A hero, an immune adventure. Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon, check the links below.